There has been very few cultural phenomena equal to the lead up and release of Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. In terms of marketing, nothing, with perhaps the exception of The Force Awakens, has really come close to matching the hype surrounding its release in 1999. This was through a complex combination of billions of dollars in investment, a meticulously planned out campaign, decades in the making, and a furious fan fervor no other brand was capable of generating. So much fervor that its resonance had me purchase a set of four Pepsi branded cans from two plus decades ago, one of which I might just open up and drink before the end of this video. That being said, did I even purchase these? This could just be an image I took off Google, right? I guess you'll just have to stick around and find out. But also leave a like on this video, you have to do two things. This entire campaign was ultimately the brainchild of George Lucas, which in taking a closer look was spawned as a result of the original deal Lucas made in relation to the first line of Star Wars action figures and accessories. In the late 70s, there wasn't really a market for these kind of toys and merchandise. Your big ticket items were things like the original G.I. Joes, Barbie, Easy Bake Ovens, Yo-Yos, a stick and a hoop probably, I don't know. But George Lucas had the foresight to create a deal with minor player toy company Kenner for a basic line of three and a quarter inch action figures. This was only after a whirlwind tour of rejection from the big brands, which led to a deal where every dollar in sales earned Kenner 95 cents, 20th Century Fox got two and a half cents, leaving Lucas with the remaining two and a half cents. This was a terrible deal by all metrics, but considering Star Wars had yet to cement itself as even a minor success, let alone a cultural phenomenon, it makes sense for the time. Nobody knew this brand. You'd see this trailer and you'd be like, what is this? Who's that? Where are they going? Ah, I don't get it. So, you know, the deal of course was better than nothing, but it was always a deal that upset Lucas. Also bristling at the fact that the contract stipulated that Kenner had the sole and exclusive intergalactic rights to the franchise. This was a little haha good joke the lawyers had Kenner put into the contract, but really, it wasn't a joke. They had a stranglehold on the Star Wars brand forever. Well, technically, under certain conditions. The deal was either Kenner earn enough in sales every year to pay Lucas $10,000, or if they didn't reach that number, just cut him a check for the same amount. Easy enough, right? And you'd think that this deal would have been written down somewhere, everybody could see it, and there was somebody whose job it was to ensure that this happened, because it would be embarrassing if that wasn't the case. So after the release of Return of the Jedi in 1983, George decided that it was time to let the brand rest. Production ceased on almost all fronts, and Star Wars largely faded from the public consciousness. There had always been rumblings about additional movies, prequels and sequels and the like, but an official announcement concerning the next three movies wasn't formally made until late 1993 via Variety magazine. In order to prepare for what everyone at Lucasfilm was quietly confident would be another global phenomenon, a trio of smaller marketing campaigns were implemented to test the waters about what would now be possible. This started with the Power of the Force line in 1995, which was basically where, what if Star Wars but everyone had big muscles? Then there was the multi-platform multimedia campaign that was Shadows of the Empire in 1996. I've actually got a whole nother video covering that in detail that I'll link below and at the end of this. And then of course we got the special edition re-release of the original trilogy in 1997, which I also have a whole nother video dedicated to, which will also be linked below and at the end. Now I should specify that I don't drink a can of 23 year old Pepsi in either of those videos. Like say these cans right here. That's right, these are real. I did buy them, but am I gonna open them? And I guess you know they might have already been opened at the time and now they're empty. How would you know that? I guess the only way of doing so would be sticking around to find out. So in the time between trilogies, Kenner had been bought up by Hasbro, which of course had Hasbro rubbing their little hands together, just imagining all the money that they'd been making off these episode one action figures. But if anybody was rubbing their little hands together, it was George Lucas, because it turns out they had forgotten to pay him his contractually obligated $10,000 annually, which meant the whole exclusive intergalactic rights forever and always and whatever deal that was now void. The reason being apparently that everyone thought that the franchise was done after Return of the Jedi. But you know, those movies were labeled episode four, five, and six. And if that gaping hole in the storytelling doesn't tell you something was missing from the narrative, then I can't help you. This meant that George was free to shop the brand around. And boy, did he. He approached the likes of Mattel, Galoob, and Playmates Toys, but eventually settled back on Hasbro with a deal they refer to as George's Revenge. 
This time around, after a six-day negotiation, he got an unprecedented and record-breaking deal of 18%, as opposed to the original 2.5. In addition to that, he was made a major shareholder at Hasbro, taking on 7% of the stock in 1997, second only to Alan Hassenfield's 9%, who was the chief executive officer at the time. Bear in mind, this was all at a time before a script was even seen. And Hasbro also handed over an additional $400 million for the toy rights, which it turns out weren't even exclusive, leaving the door open to a Star Wars branded everything. Outside of the Kenner toy line in the late 70s and early 80s, the Star Wars branding mandate was just repurpose a bunch of crap to make it Star Wars themed. In 1999 though, Lucasfilm was not going to get caught off guard again. Not in the way that they were in the Christmas of 1977, which resulted in the selling of empty boxes to children with the promise of toys that hadn't even been manufactured yet. No, this time they were going all out. Or all in. Both, I guess. This time there was to be a purpose-built, state-of-the-art toy line. The basic line for each came with an electronic Comtech chip, which basically meant that now, all your soon-to-be favorite characters could talk. As long as you also had the electronic Comtech reader sold separately. In addition to that, we got Qui-Gon, but tall. Multi-packs like the Tatooine Showdown. You can engage in a pitched battle with Darth Maul while Anakin is... I don't know, he's there also, he doesn't even have a gun or nothing. Or maybe you'd go for the EOP and Qui-Gon with lightsaber slashing action. It's kind of interesting that the space camel gets top billing here. Anyways, there was also electronic talking Darth Maul, electronic talking Qui-Gon. And then of course, you know, you got your various lightsabers, including Qui-Gon and Darth Maul. Or maybe you want to go for the electronic Gungan catapult accessory set with super bright lights or the Jedi gear. Become a Jedi Knight and feel the power of the force. That included an adjustable belt, comlink that clips to the belt, Holo projector, official Jedi Knight hair braid that clips over the ear. That's gross! And there was even a lightsaber duel game, meaning you are able to impale Qui-Gon in the comfort and privacy of your own home. Again though, and I cannot stress this enough, this deal was not exclusive. So outside of Hasbro, you could get a Yoda Magic 8-Ball, various vehicle danglers, playing cards, collectible card games featuring Obi-Wan and Darth Maul, hailed the starter packs. But I think this was it. I don't think they went beyond the starter pack. Icon trading cards, sticker books, a 20-month calendar, Darth Maul calendar, Obi-Wan calendar, episode one engagement calendar, and also a Queen Amidala makeup line to name some, but definitely not all of the products. Oh, also there was an inflatable chair where you can sit in the lap of Darth Maul if you were so inclined. Then there was the food. You got icy poles, Cadbury's chocolate bar, Cadbury's fingers with Clippo. What the hell is a Clippo? What's that, like a British thing? What, it's like a Tarzo or a Pog or something? Four to collect though, apparently. Cadbury's biscuits, Colgate toothpaste and toothbrushes, Jar Jar Pez dispenser, Jar Jar tongue candy, Lay's chips, Doritos. Plus, through deals with KFC, Pizza Hut, and Taco Bell, you could purchase cup toppers and assorted other cheap plastic crap. I mean, good and great stuff. All in all, there were 73 official licensees in total. And it's worth noting that two of these were separate billion dollar deals, that being of Lego, and Pepsi. The Pepsi Cola company locked in an agreement with Lucas, which meant they'd be spending $2 billion to sponsor The Phantom Menace. That was bigger than the $700 million that Coca-Cola spent on the 1996 Olympic Games. This deal also encompassed the yet-to-be-named follow-up films, now confirmed for release in 2002 and 2005. In total, for The Phantom Menace alone, Pepsi was said to have produced eight billion cans, 250,000 of which displayed a gold Yoda worth 20 bucks if you mail them in. Now, I don't have any of these gold cans, unfortunately, but I do have these. In fact, you can see that they're all sealed, which could hypothetically make for sanitary drinking later in this video. Hypothetically. Who's to say whether that will happen? You'll have to stick around to find out. As for the second deal, towards the tail end of the 90s, Lego was struggling. I wouldn't say necessarily things were on the decline, but it seemed at the very least a plateau had been reached. So it was thought that perhaps the best way they could revitalize the brand was through licensing. This only happened after a fair bit of pushback because some of the higher ups at Lego didn't want what was always considered a family friendly brand to have its logo slapped next to the word wars. But you know, money, and a deal was struck that extended into 2006. But neither company have ever let that license lapse because it has always proven extremely profitable. The first products were launched in March of 1999 and focused on the original trilogy ships and vehicles. And then to coincide with The Phantom Menace in May, you got anything and everything 
Phantom Menace related, even including a droid developer kit in the latter part of 1999 to coincide with Christmas. The first year's sales exceeded the company's initial forecast by 500 and one-sixth of all sales could be attributed to LEGO Star Wars products. Since 1999, the two brands have expanded their deal into enormous LEGO recreations of some of the larger vehicles, plus have also branched into animation and video games. Speaking of which, two official The Phantom Menace video games were released in May of 1999. Star Wars Episode One Racer and The Phantom Menace video game. Racer lets you take control of various pod races across multiple planets and tracks beyond what was seen in the movie, with Jake Lloyd returning to voice Anakin Skywalker on both the PC and Nintendo 64 version. This game has proven to be the more popular of the two games released, seeing as it's always been spoken fondly of, leading up to its 2020 re-release on all major platforms. The second game, however, a hybrid action adventure with RPG elements that loosely follows the events of the films, almost immediately began to show its age. While it's fun and strange and does a pretty solid job of replicating the film using the technology of the time, it's more of a weird oddity than anything else. We actually recently played it for Caravan of Garbage if you'd like to get a good look at what that's all about. These were followed up by a pinball game in June, the battle for Naboo in December, and the likes of Jedi Power Battles, an arcade racing unit, and Obi-Wan's Adventures on the Game Boy Color in the year 2000. But you know, once you start releasing tie-in games in subsequent years, this isn't me so much talking about the marketing campaign as it is just naming Star Wars games that came out. Print media, if you are familiar with its existence, has always been integral to the growing Star Wars brand. Going back to the original novel adaptation of A New Hope and the first ongoing Marvel comic book series. So for The Phantom Menace, there was a straight four issue comic adaptation that included some additional dialogue that didn't make the final cut of the film, plus a series called Star Wars Episode One Adventures that also worked on fleshing out the world in and around the main narrative. The issues were split into individual adventures. So you got Anakin just prior to meeting Qui-Gon, and dreaming of himself as a Jedi Knight, Queen Amidala and Jar Jar Binks doing a little Tatooine side mission, Qui-Gon dealing with an assassination attempt by Watto, which also included that deleted scene where Anakin gets in a little punch-up with Greedo, and also Obi-Wan's story, where he pretty much just recounts episode one but from his perspective. The novelization, like they normally do, contained material unique to the book, including a chapter concerning Anakin's second to last pod race and him also dealing with a wounded Tuscan in the Tatooine desert. Its author, Terry Brooks, spent time with George Lucas, picking his brain concerning the history of the Jedi, as well as discovering details about episode two and three to add a little bit of foreshadowing. The book also details the history of the Sith, including that of Darth Bane, all of which came from Lucas himself. Does that make all of this canon? Well, I think the rule generally is, if something is in a book, then it's canon, until the live action stuff says otherwise. But you know what? I don't know. Why don't you go bother someone who works at Lucasfilm on Twitter? They definitely love that and will be happy to answer any and all questions. The book itself was printed in a variety of languages in both hard and soft cover. And if you really had a good time reading it, you could collect all four versions. Internally, these are all the same, but why would you have one when you could have Four. You could put it up on your shelf, right next to your compact disc, which contained the abridged audiobook version of the film. Or maybe you'd go for the five disc unabridged edition. And then next to that, you could put the abridged cassette version, and the junior novelization, and the Jedi Apprentice series that ran from 1999 to 2002 that explores the initial pairing up and adventures of Qui-Gon and Obi-Wan Kenobi. There's also a bunch of additional stuff, including the illustrated screenplay, a making of, a picture storybook, etc. and so forth. You get it. There was also a blank magazine campaign with cover articles for Entertainment Weekly, GQ, Newsweek, Premiere, Time, Vanity Fair, Wired, Vogue, TV Guide, and even Popular Mechanics, where they covered the machines of Star Wars. A single CD was released on May 4th, comprising of John Williams's original score. Most infamously, containing track 15, titled Qui-Gon's Noble End. A nice little spoiler for anyone keen to know the fate of one Qui-Gon Jinn without knowing the specifics of how he dies. And speaking of spoilers, or things getting spoiled, I sure hope this full can of 23-year-old Pepsi is okay to drink. I would hate to take a big sip and then die on camera, because yes, I've decided that I will be drinking from this by the end of the video. Wow, this is gonna be great. In November of 1998, the very first trailer landed in cinemas, playing before movies such as Meet Joe Black and The Waterboy. It was widely reported 
that people purchased tickets for those movies, watched the trailer, then immediately left. So that trailer probably accounted for a not insignificant amount of the box office revenue for both of those movies. The trailer was of course also released online, something relatively new to the internet for the era. Now of course it's unknown how many times the trailer was watched, seeing as there was no platform similar to that of YouTube, but in terms of downloads, it topped 10 million. Coupled that with the second trailer, closer to the film's release, total downloads reached 35 million. I cannot stress enough how huge this was, considering most people's internet speeds pretty much maxed out at 56k. I remember downloading the lowest resolution possible, a stunning 11 megabyte video file in breathtaking 240 by 128 p only to find that only the audio element was working. Okay, fine, I thought. I'm going all out on the 480 by 216 version at 25 megabytes, leaving said video file to be painfully extracted from the Star Wars website like the world's slowest overnight tour. Pool. It still didn't work, and that's when I realized that I needed to download QuickTime. So that of course became my next several hours. And it only just dawned on me in writing this script that isn't that a little bit weird that it only came out in the QuickTime format? QuickTime sucks and has always sucked, and it turns out Wow! There was a deal struck for an undisclosed amount of money between Lucasfilm and Apple to make the trailer release exclusive for the QuickTime format. In 1999, I would have loved to have celebrated this monumental deal. Maybe by drinking, say, a crisp can of limited edition Phantom Menace branded Pepsi. I might though save this for the end of the video, just in case, you know, it stops my heart and all of this recording is for nothing. My God. On March 3rd, 1999, we also got what was considered the very first Force Friday because Toys R Us created an event called Midnight Madness, which was an in-store blitz of any and all merch leading up to the film. This is something the people over at Lucasfilm took very seriously, with a comprehensive set of rules and regulations concerning what could be sold and how it was to be presented. One Seattle manager at Golden Age Collectibles was quoted at the time as saying, Lucasfilm will have agents go to stores, and if you have Phantom merchandise out before May 3, you lose the right to sell any Star Wars merchandise again ever. It's like a military campaign. Stores were also ordered to quietly kill any merch in relation to the original trilogy, which is hardly a surprise. Every time a new Star Wars something comes along, the previous something is put in a bin, for a time at least, and then they take it out of the bin, and then they go, hey, do you still want this? And if people still want it, they keep selling that particular thing. Lucasfilm also decided to host the very first official Star Wars celebration in Denver, Colorado, with 20,000 people in attendance. Hosted by none other than Anthony Daniels. Running from April 30th to May 2nd, it also featured the Jewel of the Fates music video, which debuted new footage from the movie and a look behind the scenes. It was also around this time that Star Wars Insider, Lucasfilm's official fan club, peaked at 2 million members. Outside of all of this, 20th Century Fox spent $50 million on advertising, which to be frank, probably wasn't necessary. Star Wars was white hot leading into this new release, with one estimation at the time believing over 2 million US employees would skip work to see the movie opening day, costing them $293 million. Due to their deal though with Lucasfilm, 20th Century Fox were only to receive 7.5% of the ticket gross, about a third of the percentage that they'd normally receive off their own IP. The Phantom Menace US opening weekend was the largest single day gross ever, taking in $28 million, rounding out at $431.1 million in the US and Canada alone. It made an additional $493.2 million in other markets around the globe, taking in a total of $925.3 million, finally being pushed over the billion dollar mark with a 2012 3D re-release. Adjusted for inflation, it's still the third highest grossing Star Wars film behind Star Wars, original Star Wars, and Star Wars The Force Awakens. Which is good. That's a good amount of money. I'd be happy if I had that money, I reckon. Ah, oh, but you know what? I don't want to do any of the work. I just want the money. I mean, you know, a billion dollars for a cinematic release is fine and all, but you know what's better than one billion dollars? Two more one billion dollars. Because close to two billion dollars worth of merch sales were made in and around the lead up to The Phantom Menace. Which sounds good, I reckon. I'd like that money without doing any of the work. However, this was apparently a disappointment to some. In the lead up to the release of episode two, Star Wars, look at all these clones, they're about to attack, I think. Brett Jordan, an analyst over at Advest Inc. said, it was over licensed pretty significantly the last time. The main licensee of Star Wars toys set expectations from episode one 
much too high, missing the mark and leaving retailers with action figure overload. Hasbro did end up making 500 million in toy sales, which by my calculation left them quite a bit short of what they gave up. And in the months after the initial release, sales plummeted dramatically. Bargain bins were piled high with action figures. Perhaps this was partially due to the film's mixed reception, or perhaps they reached the ceiling on the amount of toys that they could physically sell in a worldwide marketplace. It's generally thought, though, that the product was overshipped and overlicensed, with no doubt some of the 73 licenses cannibalizing each other. George Lucas, though, he made up like a bandit. Good for him. And then, of course, there was the home release market. A mixed reception absolutely did not stop the 100 million VHS copies sold of episode one in just two days in April of 2000. Or when 18 months later, the DVD release sold an additional 2.2 million copies in its first week, which totaled to 45 million in sales. And that idea to space out the VHS and DVD releases over a year, whilst people adjusted to this new at-home format, from a profit perspective, that is a very savvy move, as would be the pay TV and broadcast TV sales that would go on to contribute another $150 million. Wow, I'm parched from all this narration. I guess now would be a good time to drink a very old can of Pepsi. This should be fun and fine. It's a normal noise, don't you think? <laughs> All right, here we go. Oh, so flat, flat. My goodness. Good color though, that's what you want, you know? Just one more. Why not? That was nothing, don't worry about that. Nothing broke, I didn't knock over anything. Okay. And it smells. It's a bit like, it's a bit like rust. Like, ugh, fuck. It's a little bit. Okay. I think that wouldn't have gone well, like, regardless. Like, drink, like, sculling a bunch of that wouldn't have been good if it was fresh. I don't think you're supposed to drink it like that. Good God! I, I don't feel good, though. That didn't... Now, I don't know if you know this, but a lot of research actually went into this video. I didn't make up most of the information in this, I swear. All the sources used are linked below, but I just want to give a quick shout-out to a few significant ones of note. The book... How Star Wars Conquered the Universe by Chris Taylor. The Toys That Made Us on Netflix. And the YouTube channel Hello Greedo, specifically for his video on StarWars.com throughout the years. This was also obviously a huge edit, so a massive thank you to Matt for getting this done and putting it all together. Also, thank you to those who got to see this early because they've signed up for our private Patreon over at BigSandwich.co where there's early videos like the Caravan of Garbage series where, of course, recently we've been going through the Star Wars prequel movies plus their video games. But also you can find movie commentaries there and our podcast, The Weekly Planet, where we talk movies and comics and TV shows. That comes out Monday, but there it comes out Sunday. That's enough plugs. That's enough plugs, I reckon. But just wanted to say thank you so much for watching this. I appreciate it. Take care. Take care.